Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much uh, to Riga Graduate School and to Professor Freimane for this very, very kind invitation. And uh, I appreciate a lot the approach of uh, uh, this seminar and more in general the, uh, of the Jean Monnet Chair, uh, multidisciplinary and uh, at the same time uh, 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 focused both starting from the European Union law perspective and from national constitutional and private law perspectives. That's something, something very unusual that I think is extremely, extremely useful. Uh, today I'm going to analyze, uh, to, to give you some words on uh, uh, research we are conducting since some time together with uh, Giovanni Piccirilli, always from, also from Lewis. Uh, which is focused to see uh, which is the, influ the influence that the uh, European Union law and also the Council of Europe, the European Convention on Human Rights, are uh, determining on some national constitutional law concepts, among which we selected uh, uh, the principle legality. And today we are f I'm focusing on the principle of legality is seen uh, from the Italian uh, perspective. So how, uh, which is the influence that European integration and more in general the European legal space determined on uh, the legality principle. I'm saying some words on the different uh, way of approaching the legality principle. And then I'm referring to where you can find a reference to rule of law and the guiding principle in the European Convention on Human Rights as well as, as in the European Union law, uh, quoting some uh, uh, case law of the European Court of Human Rights where it approaches to legality principle, and, but very generally, and while, f uh, while fo then focusing more on uh, a recent uh, example of a judicial dialogue that took place uh, re very recently regarding the so-called Taricco saga, which is, uh, uh, we will uh, see soon, uh, a dialogue that, that originated from the decision of the uh, Court of Justice, uh, and then the Italian Constitutional Court reacted through uh, issuing a preliminary reference, and then the Court of Justice reacted again, and finally, there was a decision by the, European, the Italian Constitutional Court. And this is an example that says something about how this uh, topic is moving uh, very recently. And finally, I'm trying to uh, address some conclusion to, give, uh, to draw some conclusion of what I'm going to say. So, word on methodology, uh, the approach I'm following is more uh, the one of constitutional law, as I was saying, and trying to uh, take the, ca the case of Italy as an example of a founding member state of the European Union and both the Council of Europe, a, ca a case of continental European constitutionalism following a civil law tradition in which the influence of the uh, so-called European legal space is uh, has been more, uh, let's say, uh, under the, the scene and in the, uh, in the backstage, and uh, not exactly uh, the, so f strong and so direct as it has been for uh, other countries that uh, enter the European Union more recently. Uh, and as I'm saying, the, the, the object is the legality principle deemed as a cornerstone of liberal democratic states, but at the same time full of ambiguities, uh, both and it the level of each member state and as well as the level of uh, European Union and the Council of Europe. Uh, of course, we can uh, have a lot long series of possible definitions of the rule of law and the legality principle. Of course, the rule of law is a broader concept, broader concept uh, and what I'm trying to, uh, what, what we've been realizing, uh, analyzing the uh, the case law of the European Court of Human Rights first and then also the, Euro, the, the European Union Court of Justice, there has been that uh, the concept adopted there in both cases is uh, 
more vague and closer to the one of the rule of law than the traditional legality principle that uh, is typical of cont uh, European continental law. Uh, so uh, <coughs> the, the, element, the core elements of the uh, rule of law are normally kept, uh, so, and they are normally combined with uh, further elements coming from a broader understanding, separation of powers, legality, democracy, and human rights. <laughs> While uh, the, uh, the other uh, possible meanings, meaning of the legality principle, the one that is normal, normally uh, combined with the reserve de loi, uh, so that, that is a kind of application of the rule of law to the sources of law, the idea that the protection is given not by a law whatsoever, the protection of fundamental rights, but by a law that has been approved by a democratic body, tends to be, uh, uh, up to a certain extent, uh, ignored or not taken in, in the, in, as a central, at the core of the argument. Uh, if you want, you can even uh, uh, try to see this as a distinction between legality and lawfulness, but that's uh, maybe uh, too, too long to explain. Uh, the reference to rule of law in the European Court of Human Rights, uh, European Convention of Human Rights is in the preamble, of course, uh, and also uh, I would move in the preamble of the treaty of the European Union, as well as in the preamble of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, as well as in the Article 2 of the Treaty of the European Union. What you can notice is that it's normally combined with other principles all together. Mm, that's, uh, uh, and very, in this case, it's even uh, uh, emblematic Article 2 in which you find in the same expression the rule of law and respect for human rights. They are put together, and the rule of law is not considered even as an autonomous principle without the, the human rights uh, immediately after. Uh, you probably know that there have been a couple of uh, uh, communication by the European Commission on the rule of law. The first one in, is in 2014, in which uh, it recognized that, recognizes that uh, uh, the precise content of the principle and standards stemming from the rule of law may vary at national level, depending on each member state's constitutional system, but it states that nevertheless, case law of the Court of Justice of the European Union and the European Court of Human Rights, as well as document drawn by the Council of Europe, by the Venice Commission, uh, also thanks to the expertise of the Venice Commission, provide a non-exhaustive list of this principle, and hence define the core meaning of the rule of law as a common value of the European Union in accordance to Article 2. And there is also an ex uh, explicit reference uh, to the uh, principle of legality. These principles include legality. You find a list there, uh, also in this case, which implies a transparent, accountable, democratic policy process for enacting laws legal certainty, prohibition of arbitrariness of executive powers, independent and impartial courts, judicial review, and equality before the law. Mm. There, is, well, there has been a, a second, a most recent, uh, uh, more recent communication by uh, the Commission. In this case, you will, I would say that there is a, a slightly different approach. Uh, is not uh, so much uh, top-down, uh, it looks slightly more open to member states and civil society, especially in the conclusion uh, in which it uh, invites the European Parliament, the European Council, as well as relevant, relevant stakeholders, including judicial networks and civil society and public at large, to reflect on the issues. The question raises indicate a number of areas where improvement could be, could be envisa envisaged.
If we go to the, uh, look at the European Union legal system, indeed, uh, we can say that the idea of the sources of law in the EU are structured in a way that substantially ignores the kind, the bodies that approve the legislation. The, 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 the principle that uh, structures the EU legal system is the principle of conferral, indeed, and the, uh, the legal denomination of every act and, uh, uh, is, is independent from its own, the coming from uh, European institution and, and the, proced uh, the procedure that, has been, that uh, is followed to approve them. Uh, and also after the Treaty of Lisbon, that, as it, everyone knows, introduced the Legislative Act category, it's uh, in any case, uh, the Legislative Act is the one that is defined as such by the treaty. There is no connection either with the name of the Act, not with a certain uh, procedure, with a certain uh, status at the sources of law uh, system. Uh, if we move uh, uh, to uh, the case law now, and then I'm moving, this was just the, the initial part of my uh, lecture was to focus on the, the, the provisions on the rule of law and the guarantee principle. Now I'm moving to the, rule, to the case law very quickly. And uh, we got, we can, what can we derive from the European Court of Human Rights? We derive that the case law affirms that it's, uh, rule of law is a fundamental principle of democratic society. It guarantees that uh, you need the judicial oversight, so the independence and impartiality of the judiciary, the judicial control of the executive, and the due process. There are some references uh, to the rule of law in the decision you are seeing here. And initially, if you look at the first case law of the Commission, indeed, uh, before uh, the, the, the decision Zand versus Austria, uh, the idea of the uh, legality principle was the one to avoid any government regulation on uh, the guarantee on the protection of fundamental rights. Uh, but mm, moving away, along the way, the, the, this, especially the Sunday Times versus UK, in, uh, which is referred to the UK, the common law concept of the rule of law prevailed. So it, it is independent from the kind of uh, sources of law that also unwritten law can be considered uh, satisfying in order to uh, have the uh, rule of law and legality uh, respected. And we have three cases, uh, which I cannot uh, go too much, in, too much in depth, of the European Court of Human Rights, all three refer to Italy, that are extremely telling, as the first one refers and recognizes uh, as satisfying, according to the legality principle, not for the content, the guidelines adop adopted by the Supreme Co uh, Council of the Judiciary. The Supreme Council of the Judiciary uh, adopted some guidelines uh, informally. They are not a proper source of law, but they were considered satisfying according to the legality principle. Another decision, the Savino uh, versus Italy, is also very telling because uh, it uh, uh, recognizes uh, as satisfying according to Article 6 of the Convention uh, the rules of procedure of the Chamber of Deputies, but not the general rules of procedure, but even some minor rules of procedure that were uh, not published on the official journal. Notwithstanding this, they were recognized as a source of law. The Lao Tzu case is very complicated also. It's the one of the, about the crucifix in, uh, in schools, and probably you know that we had two different decisions. What I want to stress here is the fact that in this case there were what 
uh, no dialogue with the, co the Italian Constitutional Court because the, the regulation was indeed a secondary no, regulation, was not provided by uh, primary sources of law. And so the Constitution, Italian Constitutional Court was not uh, involved in the process and declared inadmissible the decision. So if you want, the, what, I, what I derive from this uh, uh, case law of the European Court of Human Rights is that it is mainly a judge of concrete rights and not of the correct order among sources of law. And the crucial object are fundamental rights, independently from the source of law in, under consideration for the European Court of Human Rights. If we move now to the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union, you can say something about this uh, uh, Taricco saga, and that's where I want to focus on the last part of this uh, presentation. Uh, the issue related to the interpretation of this provision of uh, uh, the Treaty of Function of the European Union, Article 325, uh, and it was addressed origi originally by uh, the Court of Justice. Uh, uh, let's see if it works. No. The Court of Justice in a uh, uh, case uh, uh, in 2015 uh, issued upon uh, an order by the Tribunale di Cuneo a preliminary reference is related to the case of Ivo Taricco, that's why they was, uh, committed some fraud, but wanted to use the statute of limitation in order to uh, skip the... Uh, and uh, uh, there was so the first judgment by the Court of Justice that was strongly criticized in Italy by the Italian... Uh, scholarship and by Italian judges that refer to the uh, Constitutional Court and especially the Court of Appeal of Milan and the Court of Cassation, the issued question of constitutionality aimed at uh, declaring a, the laws uh, ratifying the European Union treaties as violating counter limitations, so as violate, violating the supreme principle of the Italian legal order. Mm, this was the argument that was supported, I must say, by, by a large quota of uh, criminal law scholarship and constitutional law scholarship in Italy. The Italian uh, Constitutional Court uh, took a very wise decision, in my view, not addressing uh, directly this, this uh, uh, question of constitutionality, but by uh, referring a preliminary reference to the Court of Justice through the Order 24 of 2017. So this is the, the crucial uh, turning point, in my view, of the, the Italian Constitutional Court, instead of declaring that the interpretation of the treaty as determined by the European Court of Justice, violated the legality principle in criminal matters as defined by the Italian Constitution, preferred to, to ask again to the Court of Justice if the interpretation the Court proposed originally was still there and to be kept as such. Mm -hmm. And the, Constitution, the Court of Justice, indeed, through the judgment uh, in December 2017, slightly adapted his interpretation to the will and the needs of the Italian legal order. So avoiding a frontal conflict between the two legal, order, the two legal systems. And at the end, the decision, the judgment uh, in 2018 by the, the Italian Constitutional Court uh, let, let me say, maybe exaggerated a bit in satisfaction from its own side, but it recognized that the, the, the issues had been settled in a satisfying way, especially for past cases. I cannot go much into the details, 
but if I may, I try from, uh, to give you at least a couple of hints. Uh, let me uh, start by the decision of the 2015 by the Court of Justice. If you want, the point was that uh, according to the Court of Justice, you have to respect uh, the, uh, the duty uh, of uh, uh, fulfill the member state's obligation under Article 225, and you have to, by if needed, to disapply the provision of national law, which would, be, would be prevent member states to fulfill their own obligations under these articles. So when uh, then uh, this imp would have implied that uh, there would have been uh, uh, the possibility that the Italian legal order would have re uh, renounced to apply uh, the legality principle on uh, in criminal matters, and and especially considering the statute of limitation as a substantial provision, not a, proced a procedural one, that was the issue at stake. And the Constitutional Court, however, in issuing its uh, preliminary reference to the Court of Justice, interpreted Article 4, uh, Treaty of the European Union, as identifying a limit to European Union law in national constitutional identity and tradition. It's also interesting, the wording. Uh, they are not, not just using the word identity, but they use also the word tradition, but refer to national tradition instead of common constitutional tradition. Also making reference to the European uh, Court of Human Rights case law. And so it asked finally to the Court of Justice to reinterpret Article 325, in order not to violate the counter limits. This is the point of uh, uh, the statute of limitation where there was a set of case law from both court of cassation and constitutional court affirming that this statute of limitation had a substantial nature. So in order to change it, you have to respect the principle of legality. The Court of Justice made use essentially of all the possible instruments it had. Uh, so first of all, counter limits, fundamental rights, and constitutional identity, as, it, as I said. Stressing the point that there was the riserva di legge, the, the fact that uh, the law had to be approved by the parliament, the connection with the democracy, the determination principle, the level of precision of the condition of uh, punishability, and the foreseeability of the sanction. And the, the issue, the, the question was, uh, should be Article 325 interpreted in the way that the Court of Justice did, even when the setting aside such a duration would contrast with the supreme principle constitutional order of the member state or with any other human rights recognized under the constitution of the member state. And as I was saying, uh, the Court of Justice in 2017 indeed uh, reformulated its interpretation, its interpretation, uh, not adopting, I would say luckily, the suggestion of the Advocate General Bot, who indeed uh, at the idea that the, uh, the interpreter of the constitutional identity of Italy would have been the Court of Justice, which is something that was not fully acceptable from the perspective, of course, of uh, the Constitutional Court, and presented the case indeed not as a conflict between national and EU law, but as an EU law problem stressing that the principle of legality in criminal matters has robust European roots. And instead of following the reason of the Italian court, which was based on the protection of national constitutional identity, opted for an approach grounded in the common constitutional traditions of the member states. 
and left to national courts in each individual case, case to scrutinize the respect of the principle of determination of penalties in order to avoid any possible clash with the higher level of protection attributed to the principle of legality in the Italian legal order. This is more or less the, uh, the conclusion. And as I was uh, saying, the, the last decision on this matter is the number 115 of 2008 by the uh, Constitutional Court. Uh, essentially uh, stressing, if you want, more in this case the riserva di legge than the uh, principle of legality. Uh, if you want to summarize, summarizing, we can say that while the legality principle in criminal matters was the core, at the core of the Italian uh, constitutional identity as defined in the in order 24, 2017, the Riserva di Legge took central stage at in judgment number 115. In concluding, because I have five minutes, uh, if I'm uh, correct on the time, uh, let's uh, uh, try to say a couple of things. One is uh, we got uh, from the studies we conducted uh, in the previous uh, years regarding the rule of law and legality principle, we uh, saw some elements in looking at the Italian legal system of com towards convergence. The highest course, courts in Italy were indeed adapting, although not uh, too much explicitly, uh, to uh, the way of interpreting legality principle e by the European courts. So, the more substantive meaning and setting aside more formal interpretation based solely on the democratic derivation of parliamentary statutes. The Taricco saga, indeed, uh, shows a way through which conflict, conflicts can be solved, can be addressed. If both courts are, let's say, inclined to uh, not to exaggerate on the, the point of uh, dissent, on the conflicts, but they are according to the principle of mutual cooperation, they are uh, ready to listen to each other uh, and to, uh, to adapt their own position, a kind of solution can be found. And that's what uh, uh, I think, because they're stressing what? Stressing that there are some common principles that are at the, at the basis both of national constitutional systems at the European Union as well as the European Court of Human Rights. And it's also interesting to notice that in this case and some other cases that I'm not quoting, the, the Italian Constitutional Court indeed is using the European Convention of Human Rights in order to force the European, the Court of Justice of the European Union to change its own case law. There's been another very recent uh, uh, preliminary reference issued by the Italian Constitutional Court, Order 117 of 2019, in which it's very clear this. And it's, in my, in my view, rather emblematic that once the, Euro the Court of Justice of the European Union uh, shut the door to the possibility of uh, uh, opening the, uh, uh, entering the European Convention of Human Rights, uh, to the European Union, national constitutional courts are playing a role in this and are using some principles that are uh, adopted by the European Convention on Human Rights to uh, force the, Euro the Court of Justice of the European Union uh, to do so. Of course, in the European Union legal order, we have an instrument, a procedural instrument to do so, and that's a preliminary reference that has worked rather well, as I was arguing, in the Tarico case and possibly in, in other cases. The, such a dialogue looks much more difficult in the European Convention on Human Rights and for the European Court. It's true that now we have protocol number 16 and that has mm, still to be ratified indeed by Italy, not by chance, I'm afraid, and it, which offers a channel to, for setting up such a dialogue, but uh, for the moment it's not cannot be used. Finally, this is my last slide. Uh, 
let me try to, to uh, in, put on the table some uh, uh, topics for further research, also addressing the, the idea uh, of looking for a new balance that uh, is at the basis of this, uh, this seminar. Uh, the first point I would say that the, the interjudicial dialogue in Europe is focused on fundamental rights. Mm? It does not consider much the institutional principles of sources of law. Why? It's also been something uh, that is at the basis uh, of the uh, European integration process, indeed. On this, we have also a Horizon 2020 project that has been called Reconnect. I don't know if you have heard about it. It's exactly in rule of law and democracy in Europe, led by, uh, la uh, by uh, Leuven University. And the founding fathers of European integration preferred to leave some uh, basic concepts on the background, as they realized that they would have been divisive concepts for the progress of European integration. Uh, indeed, these uh, knots are coming to the fore, I would say, unfortunately, possibly, but that's, uh, that's what's happening nowadays, and also the asymmetry among judicial protection rights on the one side and legislative balancing and implementation of constitutional rights on the other side is uh, showing uh, negative effects. If you want, who, who, uh, coming back to the title of this, con of this seminar, who's going to strike a new balance? Is it just a task for the courts or the constitutional right protection? Is it also, and let's say, uh, at the beginning, uh, a task for parliaments and legislators more in general. Of course, at some level, we don't have legislators. That's the case of a European Convention of Human Rights as such. But the, 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 the concept we are talking, and uh, more precisely, the principle of legality interpreted in the traditional uh, European continental way, wanted up to a certain extent to keep this uh, double protection of fundamental rights. If the only protectors of fundamental rights are courts, I'm not so sure that they will be the, the best solution. Thank you so much for your attention and sorry for uh, too many things. <laughs> Looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Perhaps a, a little bit of a, a sort of skeptical or stru uh, structural question. Um, this, say, dialogue between courts, is that such a terribly special thing here? Or isn't it, um, I wouldn't say fairly normal, but doesn't it happen uh, regularly at any level that if you feel, for example, as a court, as a, as a district court, that your Supreme Court has got it wrong, um, and you get a new case that you try to give that court a new chance to reconsider with better arguments. I mean, we can see that at the, in the German legal order, in civil law, we can see that quite often. And if the Supreme Court still doesn't understand, they try to go the route through the Court of Justice, um, make the, the Court of Justice explain to this federal Supreme Court in Germany that he got it wrong. Uh, we've seen that in England a lot of times. So, um, and why not at the EU level? To, um, if, you, if, you, if the Court of Justice hands down a decision that you think is sort of, maybe, maybe it didn't understand the problem, that you send the next case and the next case until, until they get it right. And so I'm just asking whether this is so very special or is it, what, what's, what's, so, what's so special about um, this Tariko case? Okay, now I see your point, and uh, uh, courts have the possibility to rethink about uh, and they are hierarchical structured in a national legal system. In this case, in this case, we have no hierarchy at all. That's the main difference, I would say. 
So it is a determination by, it's, it's mainly on self-restraint. And that's why I was uh, uh, recalling the princ principle of mutual uh, cooperation and uh, the fact that if any court stresses uh, the differences and uses till the end all the instrument it has, there is no possibility of dialogue in, indeed. Yeah, I take, and also the fact that uh, both courts, uh, probably also using informal channels, so there, was, there were many meetings, there are many meetings in Europe among uh, constitutional courts and involving also the, uh, the Court of Justice. And, uh, uh, and during these meetings, um, these uh, issues at stake were dealt in it, and were a kind of a, uh, agreed solution uh, was, uh, let's say, determined. And then, of course, informally by single judges, possibly, eh? although in uh, these uh, semi-official uh, opportunities. And then the outcome, of course, is decided by each court. But also that the initial position of the Court of Justice was very straightforward and not reali didn't realize, indeed, also, uh, because the, the, the order by the Tribunale di Como was not very well formulated. So the Court of Justice changed completely the question, rephrased the question, and without having a full knowledge of the typicality of the Italian legal order. So these typicalities were brought forward by the Constitutional Court, rather clearly, but in a cooperative form to the preliminary reference, and the Court of Justice then realized that he had to frame differently the question and to get closer to the uh, Italian Constitutional Court. And that's a way in which you can solve uh, conflicts. Otherwise, that they're not easy to be solved uh, using a hierarchical traditional me mechanism. That's at least my, the difference I would stress in the, in the case that are all within a single national legal order. Thank you very much. Well, you touched on quite a few concepts that, that get me ticking, so I'll restrain myself to a couple of questions. But the first is, um, what in your opinion would have happened if the Court of Justice would not have been flexible? Now, this, this, this very much resembles the entire fundamental rights saga with uh, Solange, where the Court of Justice is indeed empathetic and rethinks and actually gives space only saying, we're going to give you space, but because we say so. You, you can do this not because the Italian Constitution says so, but because EU law actually protects these rights or gives you space. But what do you think would have happened if the court had said no? Would we have had a kind of IOS or uh, Lantova situation uh, with Italy, or would, would the Italian court then have taken a different approach? Um, second, I was wondering, would it be interesting in terms of research, to also compare this indeed to levels of, of to national systems which have multiple high courts, where you have these debates, this pluralist debate between high courts as well. I mean, Belgium has three high courts, the Netherlands has multiple high courts. So we have the same kind of problem that these courts officially don't recognize each other, and they need to. So would that be an interesting comparator to say, indeed, what is unique about EU courts and what is inherent in just judicial dialogue between non-hierarchically linked judicial actors. Um, and third, on the political level, I agree that courts are limited in what they can do, but it seems that EU law seems to force courts to do a lot of things. So, um, I mean, the Bundesverfassungsgericht is now trying to define democracy, which is tough. Um, but it seems that they are the only ones allow, well, invited to do so because EU law comes in via the legal route. So it's courts that have to respond to EU law in a legal manner. And I was just wondering, I think we need to broaden that, but how would you see that? How do you see a dialogue other than the courts on such a legal concept? Members of parliament discussing the rule of law or um, how, how, what, what image do you have of this, this non-judicial dialogue on, on concepts like these? Because I would be interested to see how we could get away from the courts on this point. Okay, thanks a lot for the three questions. Sorry. No, excellent questions, of course. 
uh, I the, the first one I would answer rather uh, bluntly, uh, let's say, in the sense that uh, uh, I, I think that the Italian Constitutional Court would have applied the counter limits doctrine for the first time to the European Union treaties and its law of execution, saying that the law of the execution of the European treaties is against the Supreme Court's uh, principle. The, so it was a wise move for both sides to, to move, to self-limit themselves and uh, to, to put themselves in a cooperative approach. And there was a lot of uh, pressure to the Constitutional Court to act, to decide in this way also at the first round, shortly after the decision of the, the European Court of Justice. So the move by the Constitutional Court was a wise one, and I think the, the European Court of Justice was up to a certain extent obliged to move forward and to, and to, to rethink a bit the initial position, its initial position in order to, so I don't know if that has been also negotiating in a, in a formal context, so if the Constitutional Court, but I don't think so, that uh, was a, a way of a mutual adaptation and a, real dialogue, I would say, in order to, it's, a, it's up to a certain extent, if you want to go on with the metaphor, metaphor of a dialogue, you can say, if you are really wanting to help a student in a oral exam, in Italy we have oral exams at the university uh, mostly, and if the students go, starts by saying something that is completely wrong, what can you say if you want to help him? You say, can you repeat please? Up to a certain extent, the, the, the Italian Constitutional Court did something similar, eh, if you want. Uh, realized the Court of Justice said something that was uh, wrong according to the standard, to the Italian Constitutional Law standards, and offered the opportunity to, to say it again in a different way. And the Court of Justice was rather honest, not in denying completely what it said in the first decision, but reframing it at taking into consideration the typicalities of the Italian cases. So each actor played uh, rather correctly its own role. That's at least my, uh, and luckily we didn't get to the, uh, the conclusion that you were foreseeing as an hypothesis, of course. Uh, yes, it's true, also in Italy we have multiple high courts and uh, the, court, the, the Constitutional Court, the Supreme Court of Cassation, the Council of States, and we have many cases of contrast among them. That's absolutely the case. Uh, but they are, we are within the same legal order. It doesn't mean that the contrast cannot be very strong, but there are some, uh, as I was uh, saying before, some hierarchical criteria for solving this contrast. Sometimes they, they are not so hierarchical as uh, uh, the Council of State does not recognize the, uh, the Court of Cassation apart from jurisdiction issues, for instance. So, <laughs> and also some cases, in, also on, du on dual uh, preliminarity, we have currently different views between the Court of Cassation and the Italian Constitutional Court. So some, some issues are open. Uh, I would not say that this is exactly the same thing, that uh, the, the, in the case of the preliminary reference, we have a sp special procedure that is explicitly aimed at solving and interpreting EU law. And now EU law includes, the because of Article 4, Number 2, it includes the needs to respect national constitutional identities. And, of course, does it mean that it's up to the, to the Court of Justice to decide which is the Italian constitutional identity, which, is, which principle is part or not of the Italian constitutional identity. I would not say so. That's why I'm criticizing the Advocate General. Because it's up to the, it's consistent with the nature of a, uh, the composite constitution of the European Union. That's, uh, in my view, is the correct way of uh, framing the, and also Article 50, to a certain extent, <laughs> could be framed in this way, but you, you show very well the, all the contradiction and, on this case, on Article 50 on this. Uh, but in any case, that's, that's, uh, it's, it's correct that the Court of Justice does not interpret, uh, goes too far in interpreting which are, which are the, the uh, constitutional identities of every member state. And finally, 
I don't know if I got uh, cor correctly your question. Uh, my point is that uh, maybe not, uh, not necessarily through the traditional principle of riserva di legge, of uh, legality principle and so on, but we have to find in, in the legal system we are, in the European legal area, space if you want, some way to give more space, more place to the uh, balancing operating by the legislators. The interjudicial dialogue is functioning, courts are doing their job in protecting very well, very effectively in protecting uh, uh, fundamental rights in the EU. That's, uh, I think is one of the outcomes of, <laughs> of the research that has been conducted here. But is this enough? And as long as the European Union is increasing its own uh, area of competence, as long as we are, uh, do, can we leave the balancing ent almost entirely to the, the courts in protecting, because protecting rights means balancing among them, finding a balance. And, uh, and should this balance only be determined by the courts or we need some mechanism that allow us to give more place to, to legislation more in general? If you want, it's the dispute between legal and political constitution, it's not to a certain extent. Thank you. I'm <coughs> sorry for getting to back to that again. Yes. Um, don't you think that this was a sort of a lucky case in terms of the first decision of the Court of Justice was indeed simply wrong? Uh, because um, I also think that in substance, the second decision was much more in line on uh, how the court dealt before with issues of, uh, of the, criminal, the criminal law, EU law um, conflicts. Just remember this old Italian case, the Arcaro case, where the courts of justice said you, you don't need to, or you can't um, interpret national waste law in the light of the directive uh, when, if that leads to criminal um, to, to criminal offense under Italian law because the, the, the law was too uncertain um, at the national level uh, to make up for a criminal offense. So I thought that the court even say under European principle, common principles would see that criminal law is special um, or when it comes to the conflict between national law and EU law. Um, and as, as to just uh, a remark on your final comment that you say, where you're saying that um, the legislator should be more involved in sort of striking the balance. I mean, that is very typical, I find, at least in EU civil law, EU consumer law, et cetera, where, where these sort of technicalities, prescription periods, burden of proof, and so on, are increasingly regulated by sec EU secondary law. So the, um, very often there is a gap, then the Court of Justice has to do something and then the legislator follows behind, and in the next round of legislation, they clarify a lot of these issues or, or determine this is the right period, etc. Yeah, thank you for both uh, questions. Uh, yeah, on, on the on the first one, I'm not saying that the first decision by the Court of Justice was completely wrong, uh, but didn't take into consideration. Uh, some elements of the typicality of also Italian criminal law, that's the point, uh, if you want. So in, and, and the general principle of criminal law, yeah. It referred as it was a case of not compliance to Article 325. Hmm? Very, uh, and that's why it, it caused many problems. But, uh, uh, and uh, yes, that's, I, I, I completely share your view in the sense that the task for legislators in contemporary uh, society, especially in Europe, is extremely tough, extremely difficult. Uh, and uh, my further point, if you want, is that uh, uh, we cannot anymore uh, reason on constitutional courts and more in general constitutional adjudication as uh, counter-majoritarian bodies aimed at limiting the parliaments. That's not anymore true in the most cases. And we can realize that more and more constitutional courts are indeed 
operating to protect the legislator up to a certain extent more recently, because they realize that if the legislation doesn't do its own job, eh, the first balance between fundamental rights, the Constitutional Court had big difficulties in doing so. And they prefer to have a piece of legislation on which they have to judge. If they don't have a piece of legislation, their task is much, much harder. So that's at least my, my view. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lupo.